and this will be available. This will be available on our website um, shortly. Today, in gardening with the masters online, we welcome three Sandoval Extension master gardeners. First up, we have John Zarola. John, can you give a wave there? I think people can see you. There we go. John Zarola will talk to us about no-till gardening. He's an Albuquerque master composter in addition to being a master gardener. You may remember him from his presentation last year all about composting. His video from last year is still available on our website. His favorite garden or his favorite from the garden is a combination of tomatoes and arugula. So thank you, John. He'll be up first. He'll be followed by Catherine Richards. You wanna wave, Catherine? There she is. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine will teach us how to grow vegetables in straw bales. Catherine is a lifetime master gardener. She's the creator of the Homescapes program and she has participated in Xeriscape conferences for over 15 years. She lives in Placitas and her favorite, her favorite from the garden, she says, hands down is fresh tomatoes. Thanks Catherine for being with us today. And last, we'll have Kevin Konetsny who will talk about raised beds. There he is waving. <laughs> um, he'll talk about raised bed, using raised beds for growing vegetables. Kevin lives in Rio Rancho. He's been a master gardener since 2020. Last year, he gave a more extensive presentation about raised beds. So if you're um, intrigued and want to know more, you can also see that one on our website. His favorite from the garden is also tomatoes, but paired with garlic. So thank you, John, Catherine, and Kevin for being with us. Um, the format for today, each of our presenters will talk for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we're gonna follow that by questions and answers, um, and we'll finish up at 11.30. So again, if you have questions, if you'll just put them in the chat, I'm gonna hold the questions until the end of Kevin's presentation, and then we'll um, go through your questions there. So I'm going to turn it over to you, John. If you can start screen sharing your... Uh, okay. Um, have we got it? Not yet. Okay. Let's see what we'll do here. Uh, <laughs> While he's... Well, you, Sorry. you go ahead and keep working, John. While he's while he's getting his um his presentation up, I want to just invite you to um our website where you can connect with us um at sandovalmastergardeners.com and you'll find there links to our Facebook page, our Instagram account, and also a newsletter. So here we got John going now. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now, John. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, is is the screen good? It's perfect. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's talk about soil care and management. And this is an overview of uh, what I'll be mentioning today. This is a very brief pre presentation, but I'll start out with the four, four soil health principles. Um, the most important one for today is minimize soil disturbance. Um, then we'll talk about soil particle aggregation for soil structure, the history of soil farming practices, conservation soil management, that is low-till or no-till. And then we'll apply some of these uh, uh, principles to our desert homestead. Um, I'm stuck. Let's go. There we go. Uh, before I start with my presentation, I just wanted to let you know uh, that we're uh, a new soil health testing lab is opening uh, very close by. Uh, their grand opening is tomorrow, the 26th, and it will be at the Los, uh, Los Ranchos Agri Nature Center on Rio Grande. And if you want to read about that, they have a nice write up as to what they're going to be doing at mrgcd.com. So let's consider the uh, soil health principles. And this is for urban, suburban, and farm soils. And this uh, has been up since about 2014, as near as I can figure. 
and it is from nrcs.usda.gov. And that is a really fine website um, that discusses all of these principles. Well, the one we're gonna focus on today is in the upper right hand corner there, it's minimize soil disturbance. And so what is mentioned there is no-till, reduce till, control traffic, avoid tillage when, when, when wet, and IPM, which is integrated pest management. So it's important to review um, soil particle aggregation. And this is an ongoing process uh, in any garden soil. And it's the process by which soil particles, that is the sand, silt, and clay particles, uh, stick together to form aggregates. And an important point about that is that when um, a soil is well aggregated, uh, there are pore spaces in it. So if you look at the, um, the ideal, this is an ideal soil on the right, half of that soil is almost uh, mineral particles, which would be sand, silt, and clay particles. But notice the other half are uh, pore spaces. And those are spaces for water and for air. And then importantly, the little slice that drops down is ideally 5% organic matter in any soil sample. And so by forming these little channels in the soil after particle aggregation, um, water infiltrates, air infiltrates, and roots can penetrate uh, into the soil itself. And this improves nutrient flow and microorganism functioning. Um, so soil particle aggregation is accomplished by biofilms. These are glues made by soil microorganisms, plant roots, and earthworms. So the, um, the end point of, of particle aggregation is called tilt. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. But to the right, there is a picture of, uh, of a garden soil that has good tilth. So some simple details on how particle aggregation works. Um, organic matter that we add to the soil um, uh, feeds the soil microorganisms, which make uh, the biofilms or the glues, which bind the sand, silt, and clay particles together. And when those particles come together, the space that they formerly occupied now becomes empty, and that is the pore space. And so as this occurs, the soil, I, I call it fluffiness. Um, the technical term for it is tilth. And this, this is an ongoing and continuous process uh, in the soil. So as mentioned, the biofilms are the glues that uh, pull these soil particles together and help them stick together. So you can see in the picture on the right there, uh, there are various min mineral particles in there. There's uh, airspace in there. And right in the center is organic uh, matter. So the uh, plants themselves produce a substance called mucigel, which is very sticky. The microorganisms produce biofilms. Fungi produce glomalin and worms produce slime. So these are all the uh, glues produced naturally, which are gonna bind those sand, silt, and so, uh, clay particles together. And, and this particle aggregation is an ongoing process and it's sustained by the regular addition of organic material to our needy desert soil. OM uh, is organic material feeds the microorganisms which make the glues, which hold the particles together. The, the word tilt comes from the old English to labor or to work. Uh, for us, tilt um, in general means the workability of the soil. For me, it means the fluffiness of the soil. And soil is fluffy when it has air 
and, and water spaces in it. So season after season of destruction of soils, uh, the structural architecture, then the soil may collapse, resulting in compaction. A way to plant in collapsing or collapsed soil is to plow that soil. Now that situation may be improved by slow transition to low or no-till soil management. So I borrowed this slide from uh, someone else. It obviously looks different from the rest of them, but uh, on the right side, you see uh, good soil tilth. And then, uh, I'm sorry, on the left side, you see good soil tilth. And then on the right side, you see compacted soil. So compaction, in a sense, reduces tilth. So we, Im we improve tilth, which is improving soil structure by adding organic material, uh, treating the soil gently with low or no till um, um, plowing. And uh, it's recommended that we don't work soils when they're wet. <clears throat> so conventional tillage um, uh, means regular deep plowing of soils, which results in the mechanical breakdown of that structure that those microorganisms made glues for um, and help to create tilth. Conservation soil management provides an alternative that is low till or no till uh, uh, treatment of your garden soil. Transition from no, from no till happens, I'm sorry, transition to no till happens intentionally over time. So the effects of um, plowing, there's a mechanical action which has a negative impact on soil structure or tilt. And then soil compaction may occur below the blades and from the weight of the equipment. And then you get evaporation of exposed soil uh, moisture. And definitely this disturbs soil biology and fungal networks. And importantly now for our current situation on the planet, it releases carbon stored in the organic matter in the soil. And then you could have wind erosion of soil particles as in dust in the air, as you see in the picture on the right. And so um, increased tillage raises the chances of soil erosion from both wind and rain. So this is an example, the picture on the left there is, is an example of how no-till works. You can see the uh, machinery there on the left and also notice very carefully that the machine is planting right in uh, the leftovers from the last season. In other words, the ground has not been plowed at all. But what's happening is the seeding is occurring right into that soil um, that is covered already with its own mulch, which is from last year's harvest. So if you look at the pictures on the right there, number one, um, the machinery cuts into the soil with a disc, and then the seed is dropped in that cut, and then it is firmed over and closed. So this is an example of a no-till drill seeding directly into the stubble. So let's apply um, some of the mindset, the no-till mindset to a, uh, a desert, urban or suburban backyard. So what we're trying to do is avoid aggregate disruption, thereby preserving soil tilth. So if you look at the pictures on the right there, starting from the top, the spade fork is a desert gardener's friend because it gently breaks up com any compaction that you may have in your garden soil without uh, rigorously disturbing it as a shovel would do. So if you need to break up compaction, then you can just take that fork and push it all the way down and rock it back and forth 
uh, and create holes all over your uh, garden bed uh, to break up any compaction that may be there. Um, if you need to plant something in your desert garden, uh, for instance, a bedding plant, then you can certainly use a trowel to dig a hole for your bedding plant, pop it in there, uh, add some water, mulch, and you're good to go. Uh, for uh, seeds, uh, depending on the size of the seeds, size of the seeds, uh, you can make a, a, a stick hole for large seeds or furrows uh, for smaller seeds. And then, of course, uh, after you finish planting, uh, maintain mulch in all seasons. And then, most important, very importantly, amend on top of the bed with compost seasonally and regularly. Um, Kevin is going to talk about this uh, presently, but uh, one way of avoiding um, uh, over tillage of your soil uh, is to consider raised bed gardening. So they are a soil water plant and mulch management system. They provide easy access to plants, thereby avoiding compaction of the soil. And you can do easy shading and wind blocking. They're useful in any space. They may be elevated. So they're a useful choice in the high desert. So a lot of what I said just a few minutes ago is predicated on the fact that you have done some deep amending of your garden soil uh, before you do planting. So um, if you're just beginning to amend uh, a desert garden soil space, then my suggestion is that you amend initially from the bottom up. And then after you've done that, then you could subsequently put your amendments from the top down. So um, the picture on the right there kind of describes what I'm talking about for uh, initial soil amending. Obviously that's not, doesn't look like our desert soil, but that's the best picture I could find to uh, describe what I'm talking about. So um, this is initial, keep in mind, I'm talking about before you've gardened in the soil, this is a, a recommendation to amend from the bottom up. So you would dig down 12 to 18 inches and then uh, working from the front to the back of the garden for every shovel of soil you turn over and approximately a shovel of compost and blend it in. And then just keep working till the whole bed has been in, amended. And in my opinion, you only have to do this once. And what you're doing is you're decompacting the soil and uh, creating aeration and drainage for that soil. And most importantly, you're, it, the compost is getting biology or the microorganisms deep into the soil. And uh, that's called inoculation. So once you have done that initial amending, uh, that deep amending, after that, you can do top-down amending. And that means uh, you can just poke the soil with your uh, garden rake, uh, I'm sorry, with your garden fork uh, to de decompact or to check for decompaction. Then you spread one to three inches of finished compost on top of the soil. You scratch it in with your tine rake and then water it in to wake up the microorganisms, then you can go ahead and plant, or uh, if you're not going to plant, then mulch everything so you maintain moisture in that soil. <clears throat> Excuse me. So once again, um, uh, continued amending after your deep amending, you spread one to three inches of compost on top of your garden bed, scratch it in with your tine rake so it gets uh, about three inches down into the topsoil of your, of your garden, sprinkle with water, make sure your irrigation methodology is underneath your mulch, and then go ahead and plant and then mulch. If you're not going to plant, just uh, mulch with four inches, and then uh, when you're ready, you can go ahead and plant. 
So there are ways, all, uh, I wanna discuss ways to improve uh, soil organic matter here in the high desert. Uh, firstly, obviously would be home composting. And below that is sheet pit container composting. Actively uh, prepared, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, actively aerated compost tea. Uh, amendments already mentioned, compost and manures, and then green manure crops, and of course, organic mulches. So those are all ways of getting organic material to our very needy desert soil. So the, the message is to manage soil better by disturbing it less. And um, science suggests modified practice to uh, deep regular tilling. Um, what is suggested is reduce tillage only when necessary to break up compaction and to incorporate organic material. Control the traffic in your garden, especially when it's wet. Avoid soil compaction. Consider raised bed gardening. And integrated pest management um, uh, suggests that you use the least uh, uh, destructive chemical uh, that's available to you in your garden. Best, uh, the best thing to do would be a, to avoid chemicals uh, uh, at all times because those chemicals are destructive to the soil microorganisms. Uh, reduce soil and manipulation to, to decrease soil particle aggregate destruction. So I'm gonna end as uh, I began with the soil health principles. Keep the soil covered in all seasons. Minimize soil disturbance and external inputs. External inputs refers to uh, herbicides and man-made fertilizers. Maximize biodiversity. That means put in a variety of plants in your garden. Uh, most of us do that anyway. Maintain living roots um, in all seasons if possible. Integrate animals including pollinators. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Okay. What an informative pr presentation. We're gonna, if you have questions for John, again, put them in the chat and we'll ask them at the end. And um, John, if you'll stop screen sharing. Okay. Catherine, to, um, Catherine Richards is up next and she's gonna talk with us about gardening in straw bales. All right, Catherine, can you do your screen share now, please? Yep. And again, if you um, want more information about composting, John has a great, uh, we have a great video with John from last year's Gardening with the Masters online and I'll put a um, link into how you can find that. Okay. All right, here we go. There it is. Thank you, Catherine. Take it away. All right, I don't see it. Hmm. Seem to be lost. All right. There we go. Can you see my screen? We can see your screen. Yes. <clears throat> Happy spring, everyone. <clears throat> my my talk is based on moving to Placitas and having no soil. So I was in the presence of the master. Let's see, how do we go to the next? Uh, who wrote the Bible on straw bale gardening. <laughs> I happened to be in Denver for the home show and Joel Karsten was there. And my screen is not sharing correctly. And so I said to myself, this will work where there is no soil because it's not only a raised bed, but it's in a straw bale 
medium, which turns into compost. Here's a miniature version of the straw bale that we'll be looking at. Um, it has three rows of uh, string across the top so that you can protect your plants while they're germinating. Straw bales benefits are there is no weeding. You can start your garden earlier or later. It lasts longer and it's protected from frost, hail and sun damage. You can locate it anywhere, even on gravel, on the end of your carport or driveway. It holds the moisture, reduces insect and pest issues, you can use it as a raised bed because we don't like to bend down and dig in the ground anymore. And it creates its own compost. And oh, by the way, did I mention there's no more weeding? Straw bale or orientation. You need to find the perfect bale, but that's a misnomer. There are no perfect bales. They weigh between 35 and 80 pounds. They're difficult to move. And it is something that you need to uh, find and then orient correctly. The perfect bale is uh, the straw side cut side up. And that means that the water can go into the bales. The bale contains strings on the side that hold it together. You never want to cut the straw bale strings. That means that you'll have compost the first year instead of the third year. Where do you find your bales? Get to know your farmers. The farmers that use organic material and grow organically are the best ones to find your bales. At the farm store, at the garden and home center. And I always buy an extra bale or two to use as a sponge when planting trees and shrubs. You can also use it to scatter as mulch, as John showed us, and also as uh, walkways so that it prevents mud. Get a heavy duty tarp to move your bales. Generally, when you buy your bales, they'll be loaded into your truck or automobile by the garden center or the farmer who has the materials to move it easily. But once you get it home, because they are very weighty in some cases, you want a tarp to move it around. So I'm gonna tell you on day one, you need straw bales, a good tarp, and a few more tools. You need T-posts to hold the bales together. You need a two by four that goes on top of the T-post to hold the entire row of bales together. We did a three row uh, bale, straw bale garden. And so an eight foot two by four works perfectly for three bales. And that is where you string your uh, wire to put your protective four millimeter plastic or shade cloth when your plants get larger. You need uh, some kind of fertilizer or organic bone or blood meal to condition the bales so that it starts the process of composting. You also need some way to water and a drip hose is the best way for watering. And I'll show you in another slide how that's placed. Oh, that's, that's a blank slide. There's the hairpins that hold your, your um, drip hose in place. And you can see that it's just the same wire as we put across the T-post and it's just been into a U-shape. A two by four eight covers three bales, which I already said, but you can get up to five bales with a 16 foot maximum for stability, especially in the wind and placetus. 
you can cover your, your crops with the four mil plastic. And when it gets frosty, I know you've had snow, windy and hail. And especially in Placidas, you need a two by four alongside the bales to hold the four mil plastic down so that it doesn't flap in the breeze. This is a, a, a three bale, eight foot T post uh, support of a two by four. This is an unsupported bale and they tend to, to tip over. Now in Placidas, we use, um, oh, we're talking about uh, conditioning the soil. So we'll be conditioning the soil on every other day with either fertilizer, which is high in nitrogen. The straw bales themselves are 80 to one carbon to nitrogen. And you want to condition them so that it becomes more like 20 to one. So high nitrogen content fertilizer, at least 20 and up to 34 or 40 for the fertilizer. You condition every other day and water every day for 10 to 12 days. Now, if you're using organic material to break down your straw bale and condition it, it's gonna take longer. Positioning the straw bales means cut side up and that way the water will have a chance to flow in. The temperature will start to rise as the inside of the bales start to break down. Every age can use straw bale gardening techniques. This is not a new technique. It's an old technique that's been around for hundreds of years. Once your bale is conditioned and your strings are attached, you want to add some kind of sterile material to plant your plants in. You can also plant seeds. But we started our garden late after Memorial Day. So we bought plants from our garden center that were already established and mature and had blossoms on them. And we planted into the material. You can see you just use a spade to move the straw aside. And then you put the sterile soil down the middle. This prevents the weeds from forming. You can also start your plants in cold frame straw bale gardens. And this is a perfect example. You get two uses out of your straw bale. It protects the young plants. And here's another example of a cold frame right in the middle as the plants start to develop. Uh, rebar on the side contains the plants rather than a tea bar, but you don't have the opportunity to uh, cover your plants with the four mil plastic. You can also use it on your garden deck and grow your herbs for your uh, kitchen. That's an example of a one bale uh, straw bale herb garden. In Placidas, the homeowner uses uh, coyote fencing to keep the bales together. And you can add bales even at the second year. This is an example from the book, Straw Bale Gardening by, by Joel Karsten. 15 bales, five, five in a row, three rows, provides enough food for a family of four. This is when the plants are young, you can pull the plastic over and protect them from hail, heavy rain and wind. Once again, you need a two by four to hold them down in winds that we get here in New Mexico.
You can uh, change to shade cloth after your plants mature, especially with the sun later in the summer. The first year you wanna grow plants that grow up like tomatoes and eggplant, peppers, anything that grows up. The third, the second year, you wanna grow things that grow down like carrots, radishes, things that can go into the soil. Anything can be planted in straw bales except for corn. It's too tall and leggy. Perennials like asparagus and rhubarb because your uh, straw bale is gonna disintegrate into compost by the third year. You may have trouble with uh, spreading herbs like rosemary, garlic, and onion in straw bales. The third year you do get a good start on your compost, although you can keep adding to your year one straw bale and then start another row. So you have something up, something down for every year. We planted our squash at the end of our straw bale and it took off eight feet down the gravel. Because it's in straw and the natural progress of composting is taking place, <clears throat> you can reduce the insect in infestations. And that is really helpful when you're, uh, when you're growing squash. In Placidas, we have one bale in one wooden container that contains the squash. The top five reasons for using straw bale. You can start your garden earlier or later like we did. Your plants are protected from the hail, wind and sun damage. Your garden holds the moisture, <coughs> excuse me, and, com and creates compost. And it reduces insect and pest issues. But the number one reason, it's so easy. And did I mention no weeds? Thanks very much. Thank you, Catherine. Straw Bale Gardening. And the book she referenced is called Straw Bale Gardening. It's by Joel Karsten. I put it in the chat. Um, so that's Catherine. She has a lot of experience. How many years have you been doing that, Catherine? Since uh, 2014. All right. All right. So, so put your questions in the chat for um, Catherine if this seems like an intriguing method of, of starting your, um, your garden and you want some more answers. Um, and it can be used in combination with raised beds. All right. And that is a great segue to our final presenter today, Kevin. Kevin's going to talk to us about gardening in raised beds. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I think, I hope you'll find this informative. I'm going to start sharing my screen now so you won't see my lovely face so much. Okay, can everybody see that? We can see it. Thanks, okay. Kevin. Okay. All right, that's me, Kevin Konetsny. I am the and a Sandoval Extension Master Gardener, as Meg has so graciously told you before. Um, this one bed you're seeing down here, this was onions. I planted a number of years ago. So uh, I do have some experience with onions, although I'm not going forward with them. Uh, <clears throat> what are raised beds? Raised beds are structures that are, uh, uh, are off the ground or on the ground. You can have raised ones like was shown in uh, John's uh, presentation where it was completely off the ground and self-standing. The ones I use are on the ground, but they're about 18 inches high. Uh, they mitigate a number of impediments to gardening. 
And I'll go over those now. The reason, let's see if I can. Got to get rid of my little screen here. There we go. There, perfect. Whoops. Well, that didn't help. <laughs> The screen's in my way of my notes there. Um, reasons for raised beds is uh, ease of planting and harvesting. You don't have to do any stooping and bending and all, uh, all that other uh, stuff. And, you know, if you're getting old, like I am, bending and stooping is, uh, is a problem. Uh, it helps with irregular terrain. It creates a natural border. Uh, it can help prevent vegetation creep. So not so much in New Mexico, but in other parts of the country where you have uh, lots of native plants that grow like crazy. Um, yeah, it would help. It can help uh, minimize that. Uh, it's, it's customizable for your space. Uh, it can deal with poor soil conditions because you're not going to use that poor soil. You're going to use uh, good enriched compost laden soil. It can be designed to thwart burrowing creatures. If you're planting right in the ground, it's very limiting on how you can thwart those burrowing creatures like gophers, squirrels, and other things. And it's, it makes easier, it's easier to install your hoops for your row cover and your shade cloth. Um, Ease of planting and harvesting. Like I said before, mobility issues. If you can't get around too easily, this makes it easy. Minimal stooping or bending. Uh, in my, my garden, I have a garden cart, has four wheels and has a seat and the seat rotates. It's got a little basket on the back where I can put my tools and you know my garden shovels or anything I need at, to be working with at the time. Uh, you can make it so it's wheelchair accessible if you have uh, those kinds of mobility issues, and you can still do gardening. Uh, this picture here on the on the bottom uh, right shows irregular terrain. If you have slopes or, or very hilly terrain, this is a, a good uh, solution to that problem to minimize the, the runoff of all your water and and um, and topsoil and all that. It keeps it well contained. Uh, it creates a natural border. Um, it keeps pets and people out. As people go through your garden, they're not stepping on your, your uh, vegetables. Uh, it's a natural border for dogs. You know, I have a dog, and once I've got her trained, she, we got her as a puppy. She liked to get into beds, but she doesn't get into beds anymore, although she will stand on the edge, you know, with her feet, her hind feet on the ground and her front feet on the, on the bed to look out, in the, out over the fence to see what's going on. Uh, they are customizable for your space. And as you can see in these two uh, illustrations here, this one angular one goes around the corner of a, uh, of a patio uh, to make use of that space. And this other one was customizable in, it looks like some sort of a dome uh, greenhouse. And they had a cut into the middle of it so they could get all the way around it. It looked pretty interesting to me. Um, the big thing I have problems with is poor soil conditions. Caliche soil, which is an area of car uh, calcium carbonate, uh, it's formed in soils in semi-arid regions, sometimes called calcrete. And it's called calcrete because it's extremely hard, difficult or impossible to work, unlikely to be amenable to make useful for gardening. Uh, I have that in my yard. And if it's dry and you try to hit it with a shovel, you're just going to run... Uh, run vibrations up through your arms into your shoulders. Uh, doesn't, <laughs> it's not going to be very workable. Uh, rocky soil, if you have small and large aggregate within the soil, and lots of it, uh, you know, to make that usable, you would have to sift it and work with it and add a lot of amendments. Uh, another thing is tree roots or other um, plant roots from shrubs and things. Difficult to dig and grow where you grow plants where you have many roots and you don't really want to disturb your tree roots that much anyhow. Soil is the most important part of the bed. You know, once you've built your bed, uh, any soil used should have a good amount of compost or organic material to give your plants a good medium in which to grow. Soil will need to be brought in to fill your beds because it's not going to be readily available. Now, you can buy soil from a, a soil manufacturer in your area and they can dump it in, um, 
you know, you can buy it in bulk and they can bring a dump truck and dump it in your yard and you have to move it. Or you can find a soil source on your property if you have, uh, if you're fortunate to have that, that you can mix with compost and, uh, and put it in your beds. Uh, you have to be careful when you purchase soil. You want a reliable supplier to avoid herbicides that will inhibit your plants. You know, Pre-emergence, I don't know if you've heard about pre-emergence, but what they are is a, it's an herbicide that is sprayed. So when things start to emerge, it will kill them right away, uh, like weeds and things. But if you get that in your, uh, in your soil that you purchase from somebody, you'll have the same problem with anything you try to grow. So uh, be careful of that. Ask the questions of your suppliers. Is this organic? Are there herbicides in it? Is there a pre-emergent in it? Do you know for sure that it's, it's good? Um, I purchased 25 year, yards, cubic yards of enhanced topsoil to fill my beds. And every year I fill them with, uh, with uh, comp I top them off with compost and scratch it in as John recommends. <laughs> Uh, thwarting burrowing animals. Now you don't see it here, but this is one of my beds before I got it set. This is a constructed bed, but in the bottom there, you could put chicken wire or hardware cloth that you buy at the, uh, at the hardware stores and you lay them in the bottom of the bed before filling it with soil. And that'll keep burrowing animals like gophers particularly from digging up under there and coming up and dig, eating your roots. So that's very, very beneficial. That's an op option you have too. Um, hoops, hoops are very useful. Um, I attach mine to my beds because they're wood. I attach them with electrical uh, conduit clamps and deck screws. And you can see in the picture right here on the left that, uh, <clears throat> You know, they're easy to install. And if you need to remove them for any reason, they're easy to remove. You just loosen the screw and pull them up. And they pretty much maintain the shape after they've been in, <coughs> excuse me, after they've been in place for a, a number of months. They'll maintain the shape or pretty much all of the shape. Uh, if you notice right here on this picture on the left, this little piece of pipe going along here, I use that on some of my beds uh, to hold down my shade cloth or my, uh, my plastic or my row cover. I have clamps that go on here, snap on, and I can also use them to snap on here and hold everything in place so the wind doesn't blow it away. Uh, more on hoops. I have used ho hoops to hold row cover to keep birds, thrashers from eating my pea seeds and tender pea shoots. They just, they can find those pea seeds in the, in the ground <laughs> after they're buried. And I'll go out there and I'll find little holes where they pulled all those peas out of the ground. It's like, what's going on here? And I realized it was the thrashers because I put a, put a camera out there, a, a game camera and, and caught them doing it. Um, shade cloth over the hoops for your tomato beds, especially to shade your tomatoes from the hottest part of the day. That'll help prevent a, a number of issues with your, uh, your tomatoes maturing. Um, they can also be used to support trellises for vining plants if they're not too heavy. I've done them with peas, pole beans, cucumbers, and melons. I just attach them here at the top. Um, and let it hang down. And then I run a piece of rebar in the ground and attach it so it doesn't sway back and forth. Things to consider when building raised beds. It'll take time to build any raised bed. So you should plan your site accordingly. Where are you gonna put them? How many you're gonna put? Um, how you want to traffic the flow around them? Plan, carefully plan your site so you know that. Um, I have beds that are 18 inches high, which seem to be optimal for me and my wife. You know, we easy to sit on. One thing I did not do, which we are doing at the Corrales Garden, is we are putting a, a board across the top of the beds on the ends, uh, well, all around the perimeter of it, six inch wide board for seating. And my wife has requested I do that with my current beds so we can sit e easier. And I think that's a good idea. Um, I use two by six Western red cedar. Uh, you can use redwood, you can use some fir, but you need to use things that are gonna be resistant to rot and resistant to, to, um, to um, uh, pests and termites and things like that. 
Um, my beds, like I said, are 18 inches high. The legs are 24 inches long, so I sink them into the ground six inches so they've got some stability to them. <clears throat> you can also use other things for bed materials. Uh, you can buy kits, wood, plastic, or metal kits. Uh, problem with those are, you know, you're stuck with what you got. You, they're not customizable. Uh, with wood, cedar, redwood, fir, um, can all be, uh, you can customize those if you want. You can get them cut to the size you want or you can cut them yourself. It's important to note that you do use only untreated wood. You don't want any railroad ties or pressure treated lumber because those will introduce toxins into your garden, which you don't necessarily want. I think you want to try to avoid all of that. Uh, concrete block is another option. There's quite a, a nice bed here of concrete block. He's, this looks like the retaining wall block. And here's some old cinder block uh, that have been painted and, and made decorative. If you're gonna use painted block like this, or you wanna be uh, creative, use latex paint, not any oil-based paints. Uh, other things, you can use uh, composites recycled that are made from recycled plastics like the Trex products you find at the big box stores. They're resistant to rot. Uh, I don't know how well they, ha they uh, handle our harsh sunlight here, but they sell a lot of it. Uh, water troughs is another opportunity. Uh, you have to make some opportunity though, or some modification to the water trough so you have some sort of drainage so you don't create a swamp in there. Oh, sorry. Uh, other bed materials, straw bales. Is <laughs> this is a little different than what uh, Catherine was talking about. This is a straw bale border with with potting soil or top, good amended topsoil in there and growing the plants. This will too break down over time and create compost. You can use brick. You know, it's a lot like using the cinder block. Same with stone, again, like the cinder block. Or you can use metal panels. You can buy metal, metal panels and have some sort of support on the ends, on the corners. Uh, depending on how long they are, you may want to have some sort of support on the sides so they don't bow out and, and, and break on you. Uh, irrigation, the second most important part of raised beds. Um, the big question is how will you water your beds? Watering by hand takes a lot of time and dedication. If you're away for an extended period of time, you're gonna have to rely on somebody else to do that for you. Now, a lot of people find water hand watering their vegetables uh, kind of uh, therapy and kind of relaxing and they prefer to do that and that's okay. Um, again, using manual valves though can make it easier but it's still like hand watering, it requires your constant attention. Uh, employing um, automatic valves with a timer is what I have chosen to do. And uh, it eliminates the manual process and requires a power supply. So I do have a power supply out there. So I have every one of my beds is on a timer. I have 17 beds and I can, uh, I can set the time for each bed for not only the vegetable that's in there, because some take more water than others, uh, but also for the growing stage of each vegetable. So if it needs more water when it's young and less water when it's older, I can adjust that easily and just let it happen. <clears throat> uh, types of irrigation, you know, with hand watering, you're dragging a hose around to different beds to get the plants watered, it can be exhausting but it has mineral investment up front. Drip irrigation works well with manual and automatic valves, delivers specific amount of water where you want it, exactly where you want it. Uh, the problem I found with that, and this is just me, so it's not, it's not universal, but I've had it fail on me and I don't notice until it's too late and my plants are affected and they can't be saved. I tried soaker hoses a number of times, uh, I find that they are able to put a lot of water in a small area at a, in a very rapid rate. Similar to flood irrigation, but these tend to crack over time and need to be replaced. So you've got a maintenance issue with those. Uh, what I am, cha I am changing over to PVC pipe for most of my beds because my beds are static. Uh, they don't change. I, change. I rotate the crops in and out. <clears throat> 
but for plants that are sensitive to wet leaves I, on my, uh, in my beds, I use bubbler heads, so they're not gonna be spraying on the leaves. For others, I can attach spray heads uh, so that the, you know, those plants don't, don't bother it. Um, plants sensitive to wet leaves are like tomato plants. Uh, they can be adjusted for the flow rate so you can get the proper water uh, for the needs for your spe specific plants. You can even set those, if you have multiple heads within a bed, you can even set the heads individually because there's a screw on top, you screw it down for less water, you open it up for more water. Uh, my completed beds, I have 13 beds that are 12 feet long and three to six feet wide. It's depending on where I wanted them to go. Uh, one is three by eight foot and I have a gnat uh, right now. I have, uh, that's my rhubarb bed. And I think you can see that right here. You see a little bit of rhubarb right here in the very lowest right-hand corner of this bed. Uh, I have two that are five by seven. One, uh, one of those is for strawberries and one's for raspberries. And my raspberries and strawberries are both doing very well this spring. Uh, I have a garden wall that separates my, uh, what we call the oasis area. It's where our swimming pool is up to the house. I have a retaining wall there because of the grade of our property. And along that on the other side, I have a 30 foot five long bed, 35 foot long bed with, and it's one to three feet wide. <clears throat> um, tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, okra, beans, all of those, uh, they work well in, in raised beds. Uh, I can attach my tomato cages to the hoops if need be. Um, and the hoops allow for sun and shade protection. Zucchini and yellow squash can be planted in the wider beds because they tend to spread you know, their leaves out very well. So I put those in the, bed, in the, in the larger beds. Pumpkin, watermelon, and other vining crops. Vegetables that are large and vining are not well suited for raised beds. However, if you have a, a big enough bed, they can do just fine. They are hard to contain in the bed since they send out long vines, especially pumpkins. Um, I had pumpkins take over my garden paths a number of years ago. It was a, a pumpkin growing contest in, uh, at Jericho Nursery and they just took over all the paths around that bed. So it was just, uh, it was a challenge. I worked with it, but it was a challenge. So they will go into my bigger beds. And if I have problems this year, I'll just build, you know, 16 square foot or 16 foot square beds for these and, and uh, see what happens with that. I've also had six, success with cucumbers, peas and pole beans in the raised beds. They can be trained on trellises and contained with their own bed, within their own beds easily. <clears throat> One thing I wanted to talk about is succession planting. Uh, I've, I've done this in my beds and it works well. It's a practice of seeding crops at intervals in order to maintain a constant supply of harvestable produce throughout the season. Uh, you plant a new crop as the old crop uh, matures and is harvested. Uh, many vegetables ripen that are often ready for harvest over an extended period of time, like tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, melons. So you, you pick a few tomatoes and a few days later, you get more tomatoes. Radishes, carrots, beets, turnips, and other, and many of the leafy vegetables, on the other hand, uh, tend to be ready all at the same time. So plant short rows. And what I've done in one of my beds where I've got peas growing I've got a three and a half, about a three foot row of radishes, three foot row of carrots, three foot row of beets. On the other side, I've got a three, three foot rows of different um, uh, lettuces and, and spinach. So they are, you know, as they mature, I'll plant more and I'll plant more in other beds too because companion planting is also an opportunity. Speaking of companion planting, it's the practice of growing certain plants alongside each other that are, can be sometimes beneficial. And there are two approaches. One is to reap the benefits of the complementary plants, planting ornamentals that will assist with pest control or a combination of both. Uh, I have parsley in my asparagus bed because it's an ideal companion plant for asparagus. Uh, basil did well with my peppers a couple of years ago. Uh, other herbs can also be used with uh, companions. Carrots, radishes have done well alongside my tomatoes, beets, rutabagas, radishes were planted along with my pole beans. So I have my pole beans down the center of the bed 
And I just planted those along the edges and they did very well. As a matter of fact, I let some, I had three rutabagas over winter and they got to be huge. They're about the size of uh, bigger than a softball. <laughs> so uh, companion planting can provide for increased yield from your limited space. If you're doing raised bed gardening, you're gonna have limited space because that's you've constricted where you're gonna plant. Uh, root vegetables take up little room and are well suited for this. Uh, pole beans can be used with corn and they'll climb up to corn stalks and that's very common. So the important points to remember about uh, raised beds, plan your site. A raised bed is a structure that once placed is difficult to move. Consider their terrain and how you will navigate through your garden. Are you gonna have to move a wheelbarrow or a garden cart? Are you gonna have, uh, again, wheelchair access requirements? Um, you will have to fill these beds with soil. This can be a considerable amount of material and will take some work to accomplish. So you may wanna, you may wanna consider getting help in doing that. Once it is placed in the bed, you only need to amend it annually. With mine, I got enhanced topsoil in mine and filled it up. And every year I just put uh, compost materials on top and work it in and keep going at that. So I don't ever replace my soil. Building materials, use clean, uncontaminated materials. You wanna prevent toxins from being introduced. And one important point, our climate is challenging. Very hot days and sometimes no rain. Creatures and pests will find your garden because they will be hungry. Everything you do in your garden is an experiment and a learning opportunity. So what you try this year, it doesn't work. Try it somewhere else next year. Um, so, you know, those are the important points to take away. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for the reminder that this is all experimental and magical and art and all of that all together. It's a challenge gardening <laughs> in New Mexico. It is a challenge. All right, so, um, so this is your opportunity to ask our three experts here your questions. And you can, um, I'm gonna start by asking the questions that have um, turned up in the chat. But if you have questions that you'd like to ask yourself, you're, Welcome to do so. If you just use the um, the raise hand function, and you can unmute yourself, or you can put them right in the chat too as we go along. Um, John, do you, John, will you turn your um, your video on so we can see you, please? Yeah, I'm trying to find myself. Oh, here, <laughs> let me see if I can do it. Yeah. Hey, hey, uh, sorry. Um, there you are we see you now thank you oh okay Great. <laughs> all right so the first question is for you john um and this is a, a question about composting and she writes last spring i started dumping vegetable scraps into a large container but it had no drainage holes i threw it all away would it have been okay to save and reintegrate it into a pot with drainage holes uh yes and um, I answered that question in the chat. Um, if you would go to nmcomposters.org and then from the left menu, uh, select homemade compost bins, you will find a trash can bin uh, that uh, would answer your needs completely. Very right. easy to make. Thank you, John. And I'm going to also reference your um, the the presentation you gave to Gardening with the Masters online last year too was really extensive and helpful. If you have more compost questions like that along those lines, um, Catherine, for you, um, the question. I mean, you said something about in the first year you grow up, in the second year you grow down, and the third year it becomes compost. When you say grow down, do you mean vegetables like carrots and beets or do you mean vegetables that don't that kind of grow along the ground i mean vegetables like carrots radishes and you can still plant in the sides of the bales because they will be held together by the strings but they will tend to uh go outside the bale 
All so right. you can you can use the bale or you can stack another bale on top of it and keep using it. Keep using it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, um, for when you're making a raised bed, if you use if you choose the metal option, like wa a water trough, would it generate heat into in the bed itself? Um, yes, it, it will absorb heat during the day because, of course, metal gets hot. So you need to compensate for that by putting in uh, by adding more water to your plants and watching your plants carefully or finding some way to shade them. Okay. All right. And, and Meg, yes, I, I want to respond to a direct message I got from okay. Sheila. And we do not use hay bales because <clears throat> hay bales have herbaceous material in them. And that will sprout and create grasses and other weeds in your uh, bales. The straw is chaff that's left over after wheat, barley, oats, crops like that are harvested. And it's just material that is carbon-based and easily composted. So no hay bales, only straw bales. A very important point. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to add to that too. On hay bales, you may have a number of herbicides in there that are specific to certain weeds, and exactly. those will come along with those hay bales too. And you don't want that in your uh, in your uh, plants. Your plants growing in that material. And so, what? Another question that came up is um, several. I think at least Kevin and Catherine, you both referenced um, row cover, shade cloth, and four mil plastic. Can you talk a little bit more about maybe why you want to do those things um, and um, what the purpose of that is in a New Mexico garden? Well, in with straw bale gardening, when you first start your plants, either from seed or small plants, we started our garden with large plants that were already in bloom because we started so late in the year. But when you're starting from seed or small plants, you wanna protect that from the uh, events that happened the last few, few days, the wet snow that came. So you run out when you first find out you're gonna have a, a weather event and you pull that four mil plastic over those uh, 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 wires and you can protect, it's like a little mini greenhouse, protect your plants. We have protected our plants from hail and the hail damage to other uh, plants was horrible in our yard, but the straw bale plants all made it. And, and to add to that, and with my uh, method of gardening with the raised beds and you have the hoops, <clears throat> if we get a sudden cold snap after you've planted, like say you put out your tomatoes April 1st and suddenly we get a, a have a frost coming on April 15th. You can quickly go out there and throw your plastic over it, clip them on and that'll help, that'll help them uh, survive through that cold snap. Uh, row cover helps prevent um, uh, things like leaf hoppers, some of the insects that carry diseases and, and uh, viruses into your plants from getting to your plants. And then, of course, the shade cloth is to protect from, uh, many of your plants from sun because we have very intense sun here in the summer and it'll help protect like tomato plants uh, can be affected by that very, very easily. Yeah, Meg, I wanted to mention my background picture are my tomatoes in September and October. And you can see the, the two by four at the top of my <clears throat> T-bar and that those plants went above that and vined back down so oh, wow it, it really works good harvest <laughs> so John how about for you that um the 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 idea of amending the soil that that I have in my garden right now is kind of it seems like a huge endeavor. Is it okay to just start with like a small section of it this year and then move on to more doing more next year? Is that okay or does that does that sort of negate what? Oh no, sure. You can do it that way. And um, um, one thing that's going to help any desert soil is growing something in it. Uh, because um, 
photosynthesis is occurring and um, the carbohydrates are ending up in the roots of the plant and those carbohydrates are going to feed the soil microorganisms. So sure, you can do it that way. All right, all right. I'm looking, um, if anybody has a question that they'd like to directly ask, you can go ahead and unmute and, um, and direct your question or if you have, um, if you're seeking advice, I um, am watching the um, chat. And so if you have a question, you can also drop it into the chat. In the um, meantime, I want to, um, to point out that I did put something in the chat for our website, the Gardening with the Masters online. And in that, um, on that link, we have um, all of the videos that we've, um, that we've, all the presentations that we've had videos for over the past <coughs> few years. So if you want to, to access that for your, um, for your information, you're welcome to do that. And while we're waiting on questions, I'm also going to invite you that um, to our next, um, in April, we have back-to-back -back Gardening with the Masters online series on Thursday, April 21st. We're going to welcome Teresa Harner, who's going to talk about landscape design. She has an overview of the process of turning chaos into harmony. Um, and that is a Thursday evening. It's a, it's a little bit out of the ordinary for us, but we'll, um, we'll be on Zoom then. And uh, of course, the recording will be available a little bit later. And then the next day on April 22nd, we have another panel of master gardeners who are going to um, help us all be more successful in their gardens the way these three have by sharing their knowledge, experience, and recommendations of how to tackle common difficult garden problems in an offering that's called What Works. And if you have questions or conundrums that you would like to to have addressed during that presentation, please um, email, um, email us ahead of time. You can email us at GWM online, that's Gardening with the Masters online at sandovalmastergardeners.org. We're getting lots of thanks for a great presentation. Are there any questions? We've got a few more minutes together that we can take questions and answers. Is there anyone else here who has experience with straw bale gardening? Maybe there's people, I think I'm, I'm interested in trying it this year. So I may be <laughs> experimenting and praying and hoping <laughs> in our own garden. Well, you know, you, you did mention earlier that, uh, that uh, you can do straw bale gardening in a raised bed also. And I'm going to, I'm thinking of trying that in, in one of my beds this year to see how that works out. That would be fun. Yeah, it will be. You said there were, it was, it means that you don't have to weed and does it reduce the pests, um, the pest problem or is it? It does reduce the pest problem, both uh, rodents and insects because it's warm because the bale is composting from the inside out. And so insects and bugs and rodents don't like it when it's so warm. And so that tends to make it, I, can, I can't guarantee that the squirrels will be deterred <laughs> because they, and the birds too, <laughs> but you, you can eliminate some of the pest problems. All right. Um, we have a comment here that's, that says, it's, um, I think this is addressing the hay issue too. Straw bales do have oat or wheat seeds that can sometimes sprout, but they're easy to remove. Um, and then another question is for all three of you. What about earthworms? Would all of you also add earthworms to, to um, the soil that you're amending and no-till to raised beds to straw bales? Would you add worms? And how? Uh, I add worms to my compost, but I do not add worms to my straw bales. They, they don't like the heat. <laughs> um, I, I have found, and I sent John Zarola a, a question on this a number of years ago, um, a couple of years ago, I think, 
I had earthworms suddenly show up. I had no, no earthworms. I put the soil in, I kept it wet. I added amendments. Suddenly I get earthworms. And I was wondering where they came from. <laughs> and I, you know, they come in from some of the materials, you know, from the, I guess the egg cases and things like that. So John, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, I, uh, Kevin, I agree with that. Um, if, if worm castings are used, uh, in a soil amendment, then there may be eggs in there. And when you uh, add uh, those castings to your raised bed, uh, that's a very nice environment for them because you keep moisture in your raised bed and uh, you mulch really well. And so red wigglers, which are the common uh, worm used in worm composting, um, uh, they function in the top six inches of the soil and uh, they kind of feed in that area. So they'll come up to where the mulch is as the mulch is decomposing because they eat decomposed and decomposing organic material. Um, if you wanted to add red wigglers to your garden, I would suggest um, the best way is to add them to a raised bed where you have uh, managed moisture and uh, a goodly amount of at least four inches of organic mulch on the top. Adding them to desert soil is probably a no-go because most of our local soils have very little organic material in them and they're very dry. And so the worms won't survive in that environment. Okay, thank you all. Thank you all for your presentation. I'm not seeing any more questions. So I think that your, your, your presentations were so comprehensive that we are all, um, and then we're all excited to get out there in the sunshine after this crazy week of weather um, <laughs> to try some new things. So There's a comment, comment here from Larry who moved here from Western <laughs> Iowa and Nebraska, and he's been in a number of places. He says he has a few new things to learn here. Yeah, don't we all? We all. <laughs> Even those experienced gardeners have lots to learn yeah. here. Yeah. Always changing. Yeah, so thank you. And and as always, um, I, I'll refer you to our, our um, website, Sandoval Master Gardeners. And there we also have um, people who are watching our email helpline. So if you have a question for a master gardener, you can access that from our website. But we hope to see you in April. Thank you again to Catherine, to John, and to Kevin for sharing your expertise, your experience, and your, um, and your wisdom with us. We appreciate you. And thank you to everyone who um, has joined us today. We'll thank see you. you next thank month. You. Happy gardening. Bye-bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.